in tonight's episode. Thunder. Andy Taylor. Rory Gallagher. And Pete Wingfield. Good evening, folks. Welcome back to a brand new series of the Random Album Generator Game. This is Series 2, Episode 1. And the first album we've got up tonight will be revealed on me stepping this way. There we go. The first album on the new series of the Random Album Generator Game is Thunder. Dopamine. Dopamine, I don't know how you say it. What is it? Well, dopamine is apparently the chemical or something that comes out in your brain when you're enjoying yourself and all that sort of stuff. So, Thunder, what can you possibly say about Thunder? A band that continue to just produce brilliant album after brilliant album after brilliant album. But there's absolutely no stopping them. Now, the interesting thing for me with this is their album before this, um, was it called All the Right Noises in All the Right Places or something? That only came out yesterday in my mind. I still haven't sort of got totally into that yet. This one came out at the back end of last year, so it's quite new. Um, and to be fair, it was a sort of earmark for the previous New Lion and Rare series, but we bring it into, into this now. And for those of you that don't know, I can't imagine there's anybody that doesn't know, but Thunder are, I think they're almost like a British institution now. You go right back to the 19, late 1980s, 1990, there was a band knocking around called Terraplane. Now, I've got Terraplane albums there in the cabinet. They'll maybe come out one day on the Random Power Generator again, but the general consensus of opinion around that sort of time is that, yeah, they were okay, but they weren't anything special. Mean people called them terrible plane. Um, I didn't know, I thought they were all right. And what happened then was they sort of transformed with a couple of personnel changes and the main thing, Andy Taylor getting hold of them. Andy Taylor, who was a guitar player in Duran Duran, who obviously well, had always got a liking for a slightly heavier type of stuff. Now, he called his first solo album Thunder. A few years later, I said, produced these on their first album. Did he give them their name, Thunder? Pretty sure he must have done. But anyway, there you go. And all of a sudden, this band were bought. They were like, it was like um, the classic rock bands of the 70s. I'd sort of just like given them the torch, like the Olympic torch being passed on. You know? It was like, well, there you go. You take this and keep it going until we're all ready to come back and join in again. And that's basically what happened. And I remember when I first heard the first uh, Thunder album, Backstreet Symphony, which we're not supposed to be talking about, but you know me, I'm kind of waffling. It was like, wow, this is brilliant. And they've just carried on and carried on and carried on. And I don't mean that in a bad way, in the fact that they've just been making the same sort of records, with them, but they've just, they've got better and better, and it's, well, this album, right, this dopamine, it's a long album, 16 tracks on it, it's a dull album. I would say, I'm not be sticking my neck out a bit here, but you know me a lot, didn't I? If you were to get somebody who'd never heard of Thunder, never heard any of their songs at all, and you play them Backstreet Symphony, and then play them this, and say, how many albums do you think they made in between? How many years apart do you think they are? I do not think there would be one single person who would suggest that there was 30 plus years between the recording of Backstreet Symphony and this. Because this sounds as fresh as that. It's got, this has got everything that Backstreet Symphony's got on it. And a lot more of other stuff as well. The, the thing you know, what a Thunder tracks has it. They've got the structures, they've got the like, acoustic bits, and they've got a, the fact that they have got a proper good vocalist, which is something that a lot of bands haven't. They have to make do with a second or third rate vocalist. Thunder have got a top class vocalist. They've also 
got a top class song, but and they've got a band that's pretty much tied together. And I well, guess, can probably guess what the other one's going to do before he's even done it. It's they were like pretenders to the throne, if you like, when they came on the scene. Now, well, they own the throne as much as anybody. And if you're one of those people who thinks, well, yeah, I like Thunder, they got on the first few albums, they were quite good, but then forgot about them. Well, get yourself on the old internet and the record buying sites or down to a record fair or even into a record shop if you can find one and pick up all the albums that they made in between because every single one of them is a stepping stone on the, the, the story of Thunder and this, this has just got I mean there are bits in it where you think you're sitting in a jazz bar you think you're sitting in a, a, a French cafe out of the pot and then there's a track on there as well called Is There Anybody Out There which is easy the greatest vocal that Danny Bowes has ever put down? Oh, I don't know. He would probably say no, because there might be something that he thinks he's done better. But that one is it's fantastic. This is a really, really, really good album. <laughs> so I'm saying here. It really is. If you're put off by the cover, I know a lot of people get put off by covers that they think are sort of a little bit over the top or whatever. I don't think there's anything wrong with the, the, the cover, particularly Thunderer. Uh, Rock band and the nice ladies on the front, ladies on the inside. What the cover's all about, I don't know. Don't let that put you off if it does, if it would. I don't think it would, but anyway. It really is good. 16 tracks, is it a little bit long? No, it isn't because it's clever in the sense that it's because it's versions on vinyl. You get four tracks on each side, so you don't get it, doesn't seem too long. I suppose maybe on a CD, you might think it's a little bit hard. I don't, I don't, I don't think it would. Also, you got one brown record and one white record, which is great as well. Um, it's a really, it is really, really good album. I'm gonna put a link in to it. Go and listen to it. I mean, the thing that you're gonna take on board with this band and they made an album the year before this which is equally as good some bands are taking four five six years to come up with something that's only half as good as the one they made before this is a top band that have been a top band now for 30 years and long may they continue i know danny Bowser's has had some sort of injury hopefully he'll be able to get out and make a Love the record pretty sharp because it'll be interesting to see what comes after this one. But you just know it's going to be good. Thunder, the last of the great British rock bands. Okay, hands up. I've cheated. In my channel, if I want to cheat, I can cheat. Okay, that's all right then. Now, what I've decided to do, random album generator game, random album generator game or not, I've just been and dug this out because of what I've just been talking about. This is Auntie Taylor's first solo album after leaving Duran Duran, the power station, all that sort of stuff. And I think a lot of people probably would have been surprised at the time about just sort of how good a guitar player was and how heavy he liked, he, liked, he liked to play as well. This album is. It's, it's almost. Um, it sounds like a 1982 rock album to me, and even though it came out a little bit later than that, it's it's interesting. It's it's he it didn't didn't sell many copies. I think I don't think he did. I don't think he even got into the top fifty in the charts. But because a lot of people probably wouldn't be expecting it, but it's a really really interesting album. I'm not going to pretend that it's a world beater of an album that you're going to want to play every five minutes. It's a little bit patchy here and there. Sometimes it wanders off, gets a bit self indoors and goes a bit poppy. But the first side, in particular, is quite good. The reason why I'm showing this is because it's quite interesting because it harks back to a different time, to a different 
era of, 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 of the way things used to work, which maybe some of you never got to become a part of. Um, and so probably don't know that it, it, it sort of happened. Now, these days, everything's done on the internet and press releases and um, announcements and YouTube videos and all that sort of stuff. Back in this day, it wasn't. And if you were somebody like me, you got things like this. Now, this is, I'll bring it close so you can have a look at it and then I'll read it out. This is the official press release for when this album came out. So you can see it there. And it's all typed, it's all this, and it's not photocopied or anything. It's all, it's probably all done separately. And this is from the Annie Chalice Company. 01434 0200. See, old London telephone number that one. And it's marked up press release. Andy Taylor's first solo album since his departure from Duran Duran is released on MCA on Friday, the 15th of May 1987. The album Thunder features nine songs written and produced by Andy and ex Sex Pistol. Steve Jones. And it has a supporting cast of musicians including bassist Patrick O'Hearn, Bryant Simpson, drummer Mickey Curry and keyboardist Brett Sinclair. And a background vocalist Flo and Eddie. There's your class today. Look up Flo and Eddie for who they were. A single Don't Let Me Die Young will be released from the album Thunder, Andy Taylor, MCA Records, LP, MCG 6018 Cassette MCGC 6018 Compact Disc Third Choice DMCG 6018 For further information please contact either Annie Chalice or Christine Gorham on 01434 0200 from 12 to 13 Richmond Buildings Dean Street London W1V 5AF Block C there you go, what about that? <laughs> no daft emails or YouTube announcements. Proper type bit of paper, which I keep inside. I've got the really album that I've got at the time. Um, there you go. So this was a little bit of a bonus thing because we were talking about Thunder earlier and Andy Taylor was responsible for producing their first album. and really, I think, helping to sit them on the right track but he did a second solo album two or three years later which was all covers of famous rock songs which is probably better than this one probably more accessible than this one as well if you see that one knocking around that's worth picking up this one i wouldn't put you off it it's one of those albums that's probably not really in all there really i'm sure duran duran fans probably haven't got a copy of it rock fans are probably thinking oh, you know it's got a little bit too goes a bit off on a tangent for me sometimes, but it's well worth having a little listen to if you can track it down. Um, Andy Taylor, Thunder, complete with original 1985 press release. The Man in the Attic. Hi there, and welcome to The Man in the Attic. Rory Gallagher, live in Europe, and it's a classic. It's only a single album, which is unusual for albums of that period. This was um, released in 1972 and was recorded around Europe at various venues. It doesn't say exactly where, but it just says recorded at various uh, venues throughout Europe during February and March 1972. So, as we see, 1972 is a good year for live recordings because that, of course, was the year that uh, Made in Japan was recorded. So what do we get with Rory Gallagher, with this album of Rory Gallagher's? Well, this was not that long after the demise or the, the split of Taste that they played at the Isle of Wight in 1970. And so this was probably only 18 months, less, certainly less than two years after that. And it's Rory with, um, there we go, that's the inner gatefold. And there's the rear. And this was recorded just as a three piece again with Rory's long time bass player Jerry McAvoy, who was with him until his sad passing uh, in 
later years. So what do we get with this? He's got, and the drum, on drums, we've got uh, a man called Wilger Campbell. So what do we get on this album? Well, it's a seven track album and it really, really is a very, very well recorded again. Uh, a lot of good live recordings from around that time and this certainly is one of them. It opens up with Messing With A Kid and that's a terrific, terrific blues rock. It's all basic blues rock. But Messing With A Kid, it, it has so many highs and lows and showcases Roy Gallagher's talent, not just as a, as a guitarist, but as a singer as well. And he does that bluesy thing where they sing, they're, they're playing along with the vocal melody whilst they're singing it at times which is incredible but it but it, it has highs it has lows it goes really really quiet and stomps back up again and a terrific 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 opener followed by a track two which is called laundromat and that's another terrific sort of mid to fast paced blues rock number what i really do like about the rhythm section of wilker campbell and jerry mcavoy is they just they do what's needed they're not they're not trying to be virtuosos, although they obviously can play. Uh, they do what's needed to support the brilliant guitar work of Rory Gallagher. And it's all very sympathetically done. Very, very well done. Jerry McAvoy's bass tone is really, really good. A really, really well recorded bass and a really nice fat sound. So, yeah. That's great, a laundromat. And track three is a track called I Could Have Had Religion, which is apparently a traditional tune rearranged by Rory Gallagher. And that has got some fantastic slide guitar playing on it. We, we forget, he was a great guitarist all round, but he was a really, really, really good slide player. And that's something that's, not, that's not something that's often overlooked. And side one ends with a, a blind boy fuller tune called pistol slapper blues and that's just rory himself with acoustic guitar and him on vocal and terrific what can you say he was very 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 good at those things uh, as talented uh, as an acoustic player as he was as an electric guitar player side two opens up with going to my hometown now on this it's the full band playing it but rory is playing mandolin so it's you know it again highlights another facet of his abilities and again terrifically well recorded again with lots of highs and lows and nice foot stomping understated backing from the bass and drums terrific stuff then we go on to track two on side two called In Your Town. And again, this is, is a good foot stomping blues rock number. Excellently played, excellently recorded. This is a really well recorded, really well mixed album. Everything just as it should be. And it really does give the atmosphere of being at one of the gigs. Really, really, really does. You can, you can imagine being there in the halls while he was playing um i only ever saw Rory gallagher once and that was in 1978 that was at hamsmith odeon in january 1978 and a terrific show i, I don't think he ever gave less than 100 percent live um and the whole thing ends ends up track three side two bullfrog blues and probably you'd have to say that bookending this album with starting it with messing with a kid ending it with bullfrog blues fantastic bullfrog blues what a number and it's like that did you ever <clears throat> you know and and then they're off and again nice lot of highs and lows in it and lots so much to enjoy roy was truly a talented player and i mean and there are a number of official Rory Gallagher live albums and they're all fantastic I mean this was followed a couple of years later with the classic Irish tour 74 album 
and you know equally as good as this but yeah again from an era of mostly double live albums this was just a single but if you've never heard it and i'm sure martin will be putting a link in here for us to to have a look at and to have a listen to have a listen to it and again if 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 you see it you probably get it for a reasonable money something like this um i've had it since about 75 i think this um and you probably pick it up for 20 quid maybe less and i'm sure it's available on cd i'm sure most of rory's stuff is uh but yeah well worth having a good addition to to your collection i'm sure it's among the favorites of rory fans i'm not the biggest rory collector i've got a, a, a good few albums um but i think this has got to be one of my favorites it just shows that a good solid band playing fantastic music playing it well recorded well produced well and so so enjoyable so again goodbye from the man in the attic and Whatever you're doing, stay safe and be careful. See you again soon. Uh, more great insight there from the man in the attic. And I need to point out that the man in the attic and myself, we made a schoolboy error big time last week because we let him out of the attic. And he came down here into Custard Central. And we sat and we had a chat about all sorts of stuff. And... I think we play Machine Head by Deep Purple. That's how sort of predictable we are. But then we realised at the end, that when we're chatting about all sorts of stuff, including all sorts of things, that we should have had the camera on and we could have put it out as a as an episode of this, and we forgot to do it. So there you go. It was a bit of a it was a bit of a scoreboard error that on both of our parts, but hopefully. He will escape from the attic. He's back in there again now, fully ensconced with all his bootlegs and his tapes and his CDs and all his records and everything. And he does get regularly fed, watered and exercised, so don't worry about that. Nothing to do with me. I'm just sort of um, leave other people to sort that out. But for those of you that may be concerned that the man in the attic is a prisoner against his will, he isn't. He's perfectly happy, chappy with his lot. Anyway, sure he'll be back next episode with another interesting little tale to tell. So, on to my, I hate that when people go so on. Like, I've started to do it, and I've really got to stop it. You know, when people, when they start a sentence, now they go, so, why do people do that? And I've just started doing it. I've got to stop doing it. So every time I do it, I want somebody to chat and tell me off, because I don't, worry, I don't know where it's come from. It's obviously come from sort of TV. I mean, they all do it, don't they now? It's like, People get asked a question, they go, so? But there's no need to use the word so. Anyway, so I'm not going to do it. On to the final album from this episode. Now this, this is a real interesting one, this. It's from, I suppose you could say it's, a, it's an artist who's not really an artist, but he is. He's a musician, but he's better known as a producer. Um... He's also better than probably as a session person. That's if he's known at all. But he's one of those people that musicians know, and he's one of those people that people who take the music seriously know. I'm not sure if you, anybody goes to the record collection, they'll probably find a connection with him somewhere. But this bloke's only made one album, and he was also a journalist as well. He made one album in 1975, and he had a hit on it. Now, I'm sure you're all there thinking, who is it? Except you're not, because you've seen the title of the episode, haven't you? And people say to me, well, why do you make out that it's, it's sort of um, got to be a surprise when people can read the description? It's because people that tell me that I've got to get this channel bigger so that we get more people in. If you don't put the right words in the title, you don't get the right part of the search and all that sort of stuff. So anybody was searching for this particular chap and I put his name in, they'd never find this video. So... That's why we have to do it. So what I would say is, if you don't want to know who's in it and you want it to be a surprise, get sorted to start the video up for you and fast forward it past the end of the introduction bit. Anyway, I haven't done one of these a few weeks ago because I'm waffling just a bit. Anyway, 1975 then, this one-hit wonder man, but 
it's not really fair to call him a wonder, wonder, wonder because he's been involved in so much other stuff. Who is it? Well, the album we're going to talk about is on Island Records. And it's called Breakfast Special. Well, I'm sure a lot of you now know who it is, even if you haven't seen it, I think. And here it is, Breakfast Special by a chap called Pete Wingfield. Now, I'm sure some of you now are going, who on earth is Pete Wingfield? And the rest of you are going, oh, yeah, 18 with a bullet. That's the track that was on this that became a hit single. Now, you might think 18 with a bullet is something about an 18 year old with a gun or something, but he's not. It's all about the record industry and, and how if a record is doing well, it's, it's said to be going with a bullet. And this album, it's weird. Weird is, is, is it fair to say weird? Pete Wingfield's got a very strange sort of, almost sort of falsetto cross between a soul singer and a Bee Gees type voice. And every single song on this is totally different. It's a, it's a real adventure from start to finish. 18 with a bullet is the opening track. I'm sure you've all heard it, even if you don't think you've heard it, because it'll be one of those things that pops up now and again. But it's a great song, it really is. Um, he just made this one album and then went back to sort of producing and session stuff and, and writing and all that. He did actually make another album, he did make a follow up to this, but they never bothered releasing it. I don't know why. Um, maybe this one didn't sell many copies, but as you can see, my copy is like pristine. It could have been made yesterday, it's sort of in perfect nick. And it's, it's great. They can pick this up, you know, discounts or something, you can pick this up for about a quid. It's the best quid you've ever spent because it is really, you're never going to have an album like it in your collection because there isn't another album like it because it's Pete Wingfield's only album and it covers so many different type of things. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's good, it's a nice album. Who else is on it? Dylan Harper's on it, playing the bass. Glenn Lafleur is on it, playing the drums on Pete Wingfield. The things that Pete Wingfield does on this album <laughs> this is at the top. Joseph, oh yeah, Joseph Edward Wright as well, has a bloke playing a guitar. Pete Wingfield, what does he do? He does all the lead vocals, he does all the background vocals, he plays the Yamaha Grand Piano, the Fender and the Wurlitzer Electric Pianos, he plays the Hammond Organ, he plays the Clavinet, he plays a D6 and the Melodica, an ARP synthesizer, a Mellotron, even a Stylophone. And he made most of the tea, apparently, as well. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Produced, obviously, by Pete Wingfield on the Iron Record. Well, 1975. Well worth tracking this down. If you've never heard whether this is going to be a whole album's going to be on YouTube, I haven't got a clue because it's pretty scarce. I would have thought probably won't be. 18 with a bullet will be, so at least put a link to that up for you. But yeah, Breakfast Special. Pete Wingfield. His only ever album and it's got a top 20 single on it. If you enjoyed this episode, please press the like and subscribe buttons. See you next time.